Hello one once again and welcome to the CEOs uh, for October 22nd, 2013. I'm almost into the close of the year now. I had stuff for a couple of weeks because there's various things going on. Starting new ministries on Friday and uh, you know, the Lord's putting a lot of stuff on my shoulder, but thank God he's making it happen. So we're continuing with the CEOs and we've been uh, the last few weeks we've been talking about you know, salubrious spell success. Salubrious meaning the meaning of uh, helpfulness, completeness, wholeness, fullness, making whole, lacking nothing, perfect. All these are the definitions for this word salubriousness. And I'm using that because the Bible says, be thou perfect as thy Father in heaven is perfect. And I hear a lot of Christians trying to make apologies for that word. You know, you don't have to apologize for that word. The word perfect means complete. It doesn't mean that you don't you know, make a mistake or something like that, it just means whole and complete. It's just like an orange, you know, you get an orange, an orange can be very well rounded and looks perfect, but an orange can be all beat up, but still an orange. It's, it in itself is still the product of an orange, so it's complete in that sense. So the word perfect in the Bible means to be complete. But what you mean, meant to be, you're complete and you like nothing. So, okay. You're going to make mistakes, but mistake is not the same as being perfect. So mistake has nothing to do with perfect. Perfect is being complete and whole. So we need to identify that when we speak to people from the Bible's point of view. Because they understand why the Bible is using that word. So all of these are definitions for that word. So I'm talking about the creator's economy or enjoyment of salubriousness. What we're trying to understand is what do we get, you know, to enjoy in this world? And that... That's what the Bible is trying to tell us from the very beginning. And I was trying to explain in the last few lessons that I had given you. We went through the Old Testament and we're going through the meaning of the books. And I told you that the main theme of the whole scripture is this, basically this word, salubriousness. And that's the name of Jesus. He makes all, he makes complete. The word salvation, Yeshua. Okay, so the whole theme of it is written and there's a, there's a sense in the order in which the books have been placed. And I've been explaining, the, uh, you know, the, the meaning of the of each one of the names, so you understand what God is leading us into to understand. So He wrote this book. He used prophets to write him. He's the one that inspired him and told him what to write. You know, he used all his uh, all his prophets and his songwriters like David, you know, the kings like Solomon, you know, they were kings. So what, he used different people, even King Nebuchadnezzar, you know, from Babylon. He wrote something, and he's here too, you know. So he rules all kinds of people to write the scriptures. And he guided and told him what to write. So, and the whole book is by Mark himself. So one thing you need to understand about that, the Bible is talking about who God is. The author of this book is the maker using all these different uh, prophets and uh, priests and uh, you know, apostles and all these people to convey to us his mindset. So basically he made this whole world and he's bragging about himself in all of creation. If you want to have a place where you can brag about yourself, you create your own world and brag about yourself. You know. But if God creates his own world, him and his son, they're only talking about themselves. They're not talking about nobody else. That's the only conversation that's worth listening to. Because after all, he created it, so we better pay attention to what he's saying about everything about himself. Because everything belongs to him. There's nothing that belongs to us. We create this illusion that we, have, we can acquire something in this world and call it our own. No, we were made for the Word of God, and the Word of God is what rightfully belongs to us because our soul was prepared to carry words. That's what we get in this world, and that's the only thing we get to take out of this world. I said that many times before. So you and I are equipped to get words and to keep it within us to the point that we take them into the eternity, into wherever we go. We never uh, part from, the, from those words. And yet the Bible says that that word is a picture of His Son. Because we tend to think of the word, like I said before, uh, people think, what is the word for you? Well, the word is a means by which I communicate my thoughts and my ideas. I present myself to the world. I present everything I have to say to the world. This is the way by which, you know, I do all these things. So they think of uh, the word as a tool, you know, to, to have a conversation or to write up an idea, you know. So the, the, the word ends up being just a little tool. But when you ask God, hey, Heavenly Father, maker of all things, what is the word to you? He's going to tell you what? The word is my son. The word is not a tool. You know, 
I can use him as a tool because I spoke through him and to the instrumentality of my son. Everything was made and put in place, but he's not just a tool. You know, he's the means by which I make everything, but he's also my son, my dearly beloved in whom I am well pleased. And everything he utters is exactly what is on my mind. So I'm very pleased with him and sure you listen to him all times. You know, that's how God speaks in the Bible. He doesn't think of his son just as a tool. He is the engine by which he put all worlds and into place and everything, but he's more than that. He calls him his son. Okay? So now if he has made us, you and I, if he had made us equipped to carry his son, you know, then what a privilege, isn't it? What an honor to be made equipped for us to be the cradle, the crib, where God can grow, his son can grow in us to the full stature of what God meant him to be. And see, hardly anybody thinks this way because hardly anybody in the pulpit is preaching that, but that's the scripture, I'm not making that up. The scripture says that over and over again, that that's, you know, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God, and the word was God. Zach Castro, that's who I'm, I'm not making that up, that's in the Bible. So it tells you the Bible, is, you know, the word is something that is very special because it's God indeed. And so you and I are vessels of divinity in the sense that we carry this treasure, this high treasure. Because remember, something that is treasure is something that you value so much, so high. You ask God, what's your treasure, my son? And I make you to put that treasure inside of you. We carry this treasure in earth and vessels. That's what Paul says. We carry the word, the treasure of the highest, the highest treasure there is in this earthen vessel, this, this body made of clay, made out of the dust. And so it is the word that we value most about anything else. Because without the word, we don't have an idea of who we are. We don't have an idea of what things are. So the word identifies the name of things. It identifies the content of things, how things will be put together. It gives instruction of things to be taken care of. I mean, without the word, there'll be nothing. Okay, so the word to God is very valuable. And it asks us over and over to pay attention. So what the Bible says at the beginning of, I mean, the fear of the Lord, and when he's talking about that, that the Lord is the Lord that the Levites inherit. You know, the Levites inherit the Word of God. And that's the inherit, that inheritance is the Lord, the Torah. Because they were going to teach the Word of God to the rest of the tribes. So the Word of God to them was their inheritance. You inherit land, you inherit cattle, you inherit the Word. Because you're going to be the technicians to teach the Word to my people. So, the fear of the Word, the God, is the beginning of what makes sense, you know. And the fear, you know, the respect for what the instructions are about something made is the only thing that makes sense. If you got to take care of something, you got to go to the manual that tell you how it's written. And when you respect what the manual is saying, then you take care of something. So the Bible is just talking perfect sense. So in that sense that I'm coming back to you and I'm reminding you over and over again. So now we're getting into the books of the New Testament. You know, we understand... In the mindset of God, the whole setup of the scripture is to make you understand how he's going to send his son into the world and then how he's going to make a successful display of him to accomplish what he wants to do. Because remember, you and I were made for the word. But what happened to the word in us is through the serpent, we lost communication with God because God was speaking to us from the very beginning to Adam and Eve and telling him exactly what they needed to do. And so... All they needed to do is to continue to listen to God and the word that was inside of them because they, they were equipped to receive the word and they were handling the word. That word would have grown up to the full stature of who God is. You know, and no sin would have entered the world. But what happened is that word was no longer guided by the spirit of God. It was guided by the spirit of this age, the spirit of the serpent. And the spirit of the serpent has not the mindset of the creator. You know, and it, therefore it doesn't raise the word in us to act like the Creator and to think in refreshing, renewing, and restoring and giving and getting joy and delight in just being in that state of mind of being able to restore and keep things going. That's what delights the Father to be able to keep care of things and keep them going. He's a complete God and that's how He shows His fullness. You know, but the devil is a consumer. He walked away from all of that and he thinks by just getting things to consume the good out of them, you know, and having those things to, close to you. Or, you know, near to your proximity, that's what life is all about. Just get something, find the name of it, and obtain that product, and just use it and abuse it. And what a joy it is just to get the latest, of, the, the latest invention and the latest gadget just to simply do that. 
and he has trained the world to think in a way that is far away from the God of fullness and completeness and wholeness. You know, so whenever people go in a scenario or a situation like a job, you know, when you work for a company, what are you doing? The job of completeness, the job of wholeness, keeping things full, making things work. And so most people that are working are not happy because they're not in a place where they can just use something and abuse it. To them, that is life because by the devil, they have been trained. Man, I can't wait to go out here and party and get this gadget and get this new gadget and get all these things and just use them and abuse them. And that's what life is all about. That's the mindset that is not of God. But the world has been trained with that mindset. Right. So they can be in a place like a place that shows salubriousness, shows they're completing things, they're, picking, they're keeping things whole, and so they can send it out to their neighbors so the neighbor can have all these things when they come and buy. It's nothing for themselves. Everything is to complete. So they learn knowledge and all these things, but they're bored at work because they're not destroying anything. The mindset of the Father of renewing, restoring, and refreshing, and keeping things new is not in them. The heart of God is not in them. Therefore, they're in a situation that reflects who God is, but they don't have heart of God to go along with that situation. Therefore, they're not enjoying that environment. You see, so that's the only thing that is wrong with all this place. There's nothing wrong with a job that, that caters to something good for your neighbor, but the only thing that is missing is the heart of the Creator. You know, the heart of the maker that to be enjoyed. Because if only if you want to live a life that just enjoys being a creator or enjoys the mindset of the creator, all you need to keep for yourself are words. Because the words of instruction that tell you how this thing works, those are the ones that can keep you acting like a creator. You create it and you keep it going. So words is your only inheritance. And you're happy to get the words of the right instruction. Okay? But if you don't want to be the mindset of the creator, then... Keeping words out of water in your head, you know, anybody can guide you to that mess. Anybody that hasn't studied anything, any ignorant person can, can guide you. Just give you the name of something and say, you can do whatever you want to destroy it and use it and abuse it. Okay? But that's not where you find the joy of God. So this book is to bring you, you know, because Jesus, you remember the, the one that means salubriousness? What does he say about himself? You know, in John 14, 6, a famous verse, John 14, 6. If you have your Bible, you can open up to that. Okay, but well, John 14, 6 in the New Testament, you know, Jesus says that. So this is a famous verse that, that he quotes. And a lot of people know it and they, they use it and they think that Jesus is talking about it. What he's saying there is, the, is for him, he is the, the only means by which you can go to heaven or something like that, you know. Uh, but in the verse. Jesus answered. Huh? John chapter, uh, chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus answered, uh -huh. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Okay? So Jesus is saying, I am the way. I mean the way, not the, like a road that guides you there. The truth, the one that reveals the, the, you know, the real understanding to have. I call that truth. T-R-U-T-H. The real understanding to have. Okay? The truth. And I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And life is the opposite of death. Death is what separates Life is what connects and brings union. So I am the pathway to God. I am the real understanding to God. And the one that unites what? With the Father. And no man comes to the Father. So the whole idea is, so in order for you to come to what gives joy to the Father, it means to restore, create, renew, keep everything going that he has made. Only the meaning of salubriousness, only the meaning of the name of Christ, and understanding that meaning brings you to that. And that's what the Bible is talking about. So, it's to come back to understanding what makes the Heavenly Father happy and what makes them joyful and to live in that joy yourself. Let the joy of the Lord be your strength. Let the joy of the Lord be your encouragement. Let the joy of the Lord be your motivation so that wherever you go, especially when you're in a situation in which you're restoring, renewing, refreshing, making things new, keeping them going, that's what relates your life and makes you really happy. You know, instead of being in a scenario where your job is and just bored because, you know, I'm just making my boss rich, man. I'm just, I complain. Imagine even that statement when people say, I just work here, but I wish I could work because I'm making my boss rich. Imagine, if you can make somebody rich, how rich you are indeed. That means there's richness in the world. The world has made you capable of making somebody else rich. That's how rich the world is. But people don't see the world as something valuable because they have not received Especially in this day, they have not received any teaching in regards to this matter, but it's 
right, left and right, the whole scripture is about that. Okay, so that's what I'm trying to get at. So if you make it to the name, I gotta get all excited here about the different part. But like last week, and like the last time I talked about this, I explained to you, the book of Matthew, or the New Testament means the gifts of God. The book of Mark means hammer. The book of Luke means light. That's the, name, the meaning of the names. And light is used for the purpose of showing something or displaying something, right? And the book of John means the Lord has been gracious or the Lord has shown favor. So putting those, those four, four Gospels, yeah, the meaning is the gifts of God hammered, you can use Mark for that hammer, shows the Lord has been gracious. That's the meaning of it. So who is the gift of God that was hammered and showed the grace of God? In the Bible, who is that? Who is the, the one that's called the gift of God and who was hammered and shows the grace of God for what he did? Who did that? John. You know, who is the person that that is called the gift of God? You know, this is the Lamb of God that take it away Matthew. the sins of the world. Matthew. No. The Bible, who is called the gift of God? And that's the name of Matthew. Oh. But but the meaning of this sentence here, the gift of God hammered. Something happened to the gift of God that was hammered. Who was hammered? Jesus. Jesus. So that's what I'm trying to get to. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, just in the meaning of their names, they're talking about Christ. So that's what I'm trying to tell to get you to understand. So there's no accident that the Bible is written in a certain order or put there in a certain order. God is guiding everything. So even the author of the book, the one that decided at a certain point we're going to put it in this way because they could have chosen to put it a different way. But they chose to put it that way. And it's been like that for a for, for long time. So, but the meaning, I never heard a preaching on this until God opened my understanding to see it because I've been looking at wherever I can see the word talking about who he is. So I can see that God brags about himself everywhere just that we don't pay attention because we get away from words. People want to hear some sounds like a whisper of some spirit talking to them. You know, do this and do that. And they think, they, no, you just need to take it to the Word. Because He made a big deal. He got His own Word. So in the Word, you're going to be able to find more about His revelation than anything else. And now I'm trying to get people encouraged and enthused about getting into the meaning of the Word. So you understand, in many ways, God is talking about Himself. So God is talking about Himself. I, I explained to you in the last, uh, the last time when I gave to the Old Testament, how there He was talking about Him coming and how He was preparing everything and the meaning of His names of the and how Je Yeshua, which means Jesus appeared, and Joshua, you know, uh, which means the same meaning as Yeshua is. He makes complete, he makes all his saves. Hosea has the same meaning. Isaiah has the same meaning, the salvation of the Lord. So all those this times that it appears in the Bible, and I, I went down explaining the order of it, but now I'm trying to tell you in the order of Scripture. So it says, the gift of God hammered shows the Lord has been gracious. So any creator, now apply this to any corporation. When a corporation makes a product, it's like a gift. And I tell you, it's a gift because money, uh, which I, I'm going to talk about you next week. I, I prepared something here, but I, I'm going to give it to you next week. Uh, which will, will explain to you what money is. Money is not the means by which you acquire a thing. But money is just the means by which you request for more of it. Okay? So money doesn't make a doctor. Okay? Knowledge. And words of knowledge make a doctor. Money does not make an engineer, but the knowledge of engineering makes an engineer. Okay? So words are what make and give you everything in the world. So the words give knowledge and understanding to people, and out of this knowledge and understanding, they make a gadget, they make a computer, they make whatever, you know, to bring comfort to the world. So it's through the knowledge of words. So words give a gift. Okay? And once they make a gift, because once you come up with an idea and make a product, then you go to the people that have the money and you ask them, what do you think of this? Should we market this? Should we send it out there? And then the people put their money, he says, and the money is not making the product because the product is made already, right? The money is just saying, send more of this out there. It's just requesting. It's a power, it has the power of requisition, not the power of acquisition. Money doesn't acquire, it doesn't get you anything. It's just requesting for more of it to go to your neighbor. Because remember, when you buy a house these days, the house is already made. Okay? Mm -hmm. So the people that work on the house already got paid. They already went home. So when you pay for that house, which the people that work on it, it's already made. What are you doing? 
You pay for the company, the bank that gets that money to make more houses for your other neighbors. Because the house that you bought, the people that work on it already got paid. So somebody already paid for you to have a house and you are continuing to ask the money. Somebody paid for it for me to have it. That's why it's completely made. So have this money so you can make two or three more houses. Because in the end, when you end up paying everything with interest, you pay about three times the value of the house. Okay, so you're asking for three more neighbors to get the same kind of house for you. That's why you're asking. So money only has the power to request for knowledge to make more of what the word has made. So word is the giver. Word gives you a gift. The word of knowledge gives you a gift. Whatever guy you that is. So that's why God's Matthew says the gift of God. So the creator gives you a gift. Okay? And then the way you have to present this to the, to the world is this gift, this gadget that I came with, this gadget, this little apparatus, this machinery that I made for you, doesn't seek anything to get from you for you to do to it. It doesn't want you to do anything for it. He wants to do everything for you, but he doesn't need anything for itself. So when it comes to the needs of itself, you got to present this gadget as being dead to any needs for itself. It's just there to work for you and do everything on your behalf. Okay, that's how you have to present it. So dead to oneself needs, because I have no needs, I'm only here to, you know, wash your dishes if I'm a washing machine, or show you the whole world if I'm a TV, if I'm a, you know, to entertain you with everything I can if I'm a computer, I'm here to do everything for you, but I'll never ask anything for myself. I'm complete. I don't need anything. So you got to present something that is dead to itself, but is ready to give you everything. And that's why Jesus came. I'm here to pay for the sins of the world. I'm going to die to myself, but I'll give you everything I have from heaven to provide to you all the care of my Father. That's the way he was presenting himself. Okay? So anything has to present itself. I have a lot of benefits. Whatever that guy did may be your service. I have all this service to give you. I ask nothing for myself, I mean, just give me a chance to show what I can do for you. And so, better present us like that, and then you show that the Lord has been gracious. And I said the Lord because the Word is King, okay? The Word is King because create things and keeps them going. To me, the Word is King. And so in the Bible, we see the word grace a lot in the Bible. But the word grace is something that was said of a, of a king that did you a favor. When a king showed you favor, he showed you grace. So that's something that was used for kings. That the, word, uh, the word grace is for people that the kings that they have favors for the people, they show grace. Because even the, the, the king, your grace, your honor, your, you know, your highness, all these titles are given to kings. So we're coming from the time of the Bible that they're kings. So the Lord who is king has been gracious. He has shown us favor. And here in this case, who God is. So the word shall show us favor. So when we show a product that way, even Christ did it for himself, we can show him favor. Another thing about the success of the cross, you know, the cross is the position of success for any company because you gotta go to work, you gotta take things for yourself. You gotta grab one thing, you gotta grab the money of the client of the company and grab it unto yourself, or take the product of the company and put it on yourself and draw it to your bosom. I take with this hand, I take this product, and I take with this hand, I take the money of the company, I take it for myself because if the boss sees that the product, instead of giving it to the client, and the money, instead of giving it to the, to the boss, you give it for yourself, guess what? You get off the cross, and you're out of the job. So with one hand, is it... All right. So look at my hand, because I'm doing the sign of the cross here. So you, you, you're on the, on, the, on the cross, and the whole idea is you're in a mediation position. When you're working in any company, you're in a position in which you're taking something from the one who has it all, to give it to the one that needs it all. Because the client is the one that needs the product, and your company is the one that has it, right? So you are in a position where you take from the one that has it all, and take from the one that needs it all, and you exchange it, but you stay in a position where you get nothing after yourself. You do not now walk after your own way, you walk after what the company tells you to go, so your feet are not for your own use, your hands are not for your own use. You are nailed, you know, you have nothing to take for yourself. And for being in the cross, you get paid. For being in a mediation position, you know, because the moment you want to get away from the cross and not do the work of mediating, you know, that's the work of, of a prayer warrior. Prayer warrior is the one who mediate. You pray because you go to the source who has it all, with God, to the one that needs it all, which is the sinner. And so you mediate. You're in a position of mediation. That's the position of the cross. And the cross is the great success for everybody to stay in the cross, you know. So well, that's why Paul says, you know, I preach Christ and Him crucified. To him was a big sign of success that he held before the world. And the world could not understand what he's talking about. 
We see, when you get a little understanding, you understand why God puts it that way. So it's the cross that needs to be presented. So the gift of God hammered shows the Lord has been gracious. And then what happens after that is the book of Acts, which I don't put, I didn't put too much in there because the book of Acts are just all the things that go after the product is then it goes to act out in the market and does the service or you know whatever he has to do, whatever the product is going to do the service to all nations, right? Because right after Act, we have Romans, Thessalonians, Philippians, all the places. Okay? And so after it has been out there in the market for a while, and it's doing the job that it's supposed to do, you know, it's bringing comfort to people, it's making life a whole lot easier, you know, it's making people rest, you know, bringing rest to, to the masses, you know, so they can rely on this uh, faithful product that has gone out from the company. So what happens after that? Then the word Timothy. After all those cities, the word Timothy. And you know what th Timothy means? It means God's honor. And you know what? I want to teach you something. The word honor in the Bible has to do with, with paying tribute or paying money to the one that you the way you want to keep going. So that's why the, when the Bible says, honor thy father and thy mother, it's not just saying, you know, you know, I don't say by words of my mother, I don't say by words of my father, you know, because I honor them. No, no. It meant that you will take them unto yourself and you will, once you are of age, you are gonna be paying money to support them because there was no thing in the Bible as a social security or anything like that for all, all folks. The oldest son, you know, who, uh, who took the place of the pregnancy, he will take the parents and he will be supporting them. You know, and we will keep spending the money to support and keep it going. So that's what, they, they, their own kids were their own support system for the parents. So that's what he meant. You know, when Jesus came, he says, you have messed this, this thing by your own traditions. You're using that commandment and saying that the guy just has to say, if I ever, if you ever made money a little bit by me, that, that was a great blessing. I don't have to be paying for you now. And so you say, when you create laws like that, you, you make the, the law of God obliterated because you're not fulfilling the, what God meant to, for you to fulfill. So after a product has delivered the, the service he's supposed to deliver and he's been out there in the market, so what happened is, the giver of, I put G-O-D here with G-O-D, the giver of the signs, or the giver, the giver of directions, because that's what God is. He gives you the designs, He gives you the directions, you know, so to understand that. He gets honored. He gets paid for that. People start paying for it because they like what the product is doing. They like the comfort that it's bringing. So that product that has gone out, you know, to show the favor of God and all of that, is, brings honor to the company. To the one that sent it, people start paying for that, and then therefore that thing becomes honorable. You know, as things that gets a good reputation, people don't mind paying for it. That means it's worth your spending your money on it, you know, because it does it delivers what it says it's going to do for you. So it becomes something honorable. People don't mind paying for it. It's worth buying. That's what it means, honorable. And therefore, because you're seeing that whatever the little gadget or service or little thing is doing, it's like a kiss from heaven to you. You know, it makes life so easy. You know, like, I can see people with all the latest phones, oh man, this makes life so easy. I have access to this. It's like a kiss from heaven. That's why Philemon means, you know, title, by the way, is honorable, right? You don't want to pay for it. Philemon means affectionate, one who kisses. So this guy is like a very affectionate, you become very attached to it. And that's what people become, you know, with little guidance and services, they, they grow so attached to it, they want to go to the same company and want to get the latest. Because, you know, to them it's like a kiss from heaven. It's very affectionate, and it's floating. That's why I put here one from beyond. So that's like a kiss from heaven from one from beyond. You know, it's like, because this company is like, you know, like a gift from heaven doing this. And so this little thing, this little gadget that's been going out, service that's been going out, is that supplants the inadequate. I mean, supplanting, the word James means a supplanter. Because the word James comes from the same name, Jacob. And Jacob in the Bible is the one that is called a supplanter because he... He took the place of his brother, okay? His brother, his brother was supposed to get the blessing because he was the firstborn. So when the father was going to pray to give the blessings, he's supposed to give the blessing to the firstborn, which is Esau. But if you know the story, a little bit of that story, uh, the mother prepared him a little venison, something that the father liked to eat, and made him uh, something that, because Esau was very hairy. But uh, Jacob had very smooth skin, so she put some like a lamb stuff uh, with glue in his hands, so he felt his, his father was already getting blind. 
So he felt like, a, you know, like the hairy son. And he went in his place to take the blessing of his son, of, of his older brother, he was the younger brother. And he took the place of his older brother, and he got the blessing instead of, of his older brother. But what Jacob did, if you remember the earlier story, is that Jacob, he was, he, he, in other words, he was the one that really honored that position. He understood that to be the firstborn it means you're going to be the father of your whole tribe. You know, I mean, you're going to be in the position of being the father. You distribute the goods. You are the one that takes care of the whole, the whole land and everything. So to them, it was a very high position of being a father to everybody else that came after him. So he honored that position. But his Esau, Esau, he was the firstborn because he was born the first time. But he didn't think any big thing of it because remember when uh, there's a part in the Bible was Esau came. He was tired from hunting. You know, and uh, he asked his brother, his brother was preparing a little soup, you know, uh, and then uh, he came and he was hungry, man, and he says, hey, give me some of your soup, man, brother. And then he says, and uh, Jacob, I mean, he says, if you give me your, the right to be uh, the heritage, to be the firstborn, I give it to you. In other words, he asked him, give me your position as your firstborn and I'll give you my soup. And the other guy was so tired, he said, yeah, yeah, man, take it. So he thought of his of the position of being the firstborn. He thought nothing of it, that he could exchange it for a soup, you see? But Jacob thought that it was so important that he could do anything to get it. So what happened is the blessing of being the firstborn fell on the right person because Jacob, to me, he had the right attitude. He esteemed that position to be very high. Therefore, he is the one that deserved to get it. And besides, God has said, that the older shall serve the younger. So God had promised that that was going to happen anyhow. So it happened, you know. But in any case, to me, that's the idea of supplanting the inadequate. So the proverb that is sent out in the market takes the place of whatever it is that you have that doesn't do as good a work. You know, for example, a washer takes the place of your hand. Your hands are too inadequate to wash as many dishes. So this gadget supplants, it takes the place of your hand because your hands are inadequate and it does a better job for you. So that's what the word change means. It takes the place of a supplanting, supplanting the inadequate. So Jacob took the place of his brother because he was inadequate. He had the wrong attitude that goes along with the, with the position that he was, that was awaited for him. He did not appreciate the position God put him in. So God gave it to the one that had a heart for it. Jacob had the heart for that position. The other one cared, cared less. He was born to inherit it, but he didn't think anything about it. He will sell that right, the right of the firstborn. He sold it for a, for a bowl of soup, you know. So that's the way you have to him. So that's what happens to you. So the, the, the next book after that, I couldn't write it down there because I didn't have more time. But what's after the book of James? I believe that's the book of Peter. Right? And the book of Peter. Okay, here we go. Yeah. Peter. Yeah, Peter means Petros. Okay? And Petro, by the way, when Jesus named Peter Petros, this is you are, you know, Peter. And upon this rock, I shall build my church. And when he said rock, he said call Peter, call him Petros. Or he called rock, he called him Petra. And Petra it means like a rock that is solid as a foundation, that is a movable. And Peter is like a little stone that can be moved out of, out of that rock. You know, you can, you can break a little rock out of it and you can move it. So Petros is like a, so what, what Jesus was saying to, to Peter is this, you're going to be a chip off of the old block. That he was trying to tell me, you know, you're gonna be this stone. I am the stone, I'm Petra, I'm the solid rock, but you're gonna be like a chip of the old block. So that's what we're saying. So this product is like a chip of the old block because it's coming from the factory where the manual is the solid foundation that tells how the product is made. And this is the chip from the old block guaranteeing that it's gonna function and do you do you that good. And so therefore, by doing all of that, what happens? Then John again. All of that, then the client gets to see. The Lord has been gracious, okay? And therefore, he gets to be the praised one because that's the book of John. And the book that follows is the book of Jude, the praised one. So therefore, you know, he is, receives all the praise, and that's how he opens up or unveils himself. Okay, the book of Revelation is the unveiling or open, opening up and revealing who you are. So that's how a company reveals itself. So this is the process of success. I told you how it works, you know. And it's all written in the order of the books of the Bible. Isn't that wonderful? I mean, it's just, to me, it's a marvel, you know, that I don't have to really struggle to make this sermon. It's just written there already. 
in these pages. All I did is just discover it. <laughs> you know, it's like, because I've been getting into uh, the understanding of uh, reading uh, the meaning of words, and now I was starting, I said, I might as well just get, I have read the book a lot for many years, but I had, you know, I had never really gone to see if there was a sermon to be found in the order of the books. So, voila, there is a sermon to be found in there. You know, and it's all about the success that God wants to do, you know, in presenting His Son. And at the same time, that applies to everything that corporations are doing, because without knowing them, they're following the same pattern that God set up for the books of the Bible. So that's to me is wonderful and magnificent. Okay, so we're going to be talking more about this next week, but more about the sense. Next week I'll be talking to you more about how money needs to be viewed, you know, how money is viewed by God and how we need to view, view money in the same manner. And we'll talk more about that, but let's go with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I give you thanks for your word, and I give you thanks that in it we understand the way you have set up things you know, for the success of the revelation of who you are and the character of the Son and the character of the Father, Lord. Help us to get into your word, Father, to understand more of what you want to tell us, Father, and to understand the success of how everything works, because you are the creator, you are the one that restores, refreshes, and renews, Lord, and cause us, therefore, to and bring our hearts to that joy, to understand that that's the purpose for which you are bringing us to your Son, so we may go into the heart of the Father. And we may understand that and live in the joy of the Father. And let that joy be our strength. So we ask all this for thy sake in Jesus' name. That you will guide us. Amen. 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 All right.